Welcome back to the La Cancha podcast. I'm joined by Oscar again as we, had, we have to dig into an interesting week in La Liga after the international break. And we're going to start straight off the bat with what happened at the Camp Nou. Xavi was the new Barca coach after Ronald Koeman sacking. And his first game was the Catalan Derby. And this was a game of two halves, I, I felt like in the first half up until, let's say, the 70th minute, Barcelona really dominated. But in the later stages of the game, Espanyol had like three or four clear chances. How did you see Xavi's debut? Uh, well, I'm first of all happy with the results. And I liked that Xavi stuck to his promise of providing width on the flanks with the youngsters that played there. And yeah, my views on the game are similar with yours in that for the first half and the and 17 minutes, we played well, but then for the last 20, 25 minutes, Espanyol really put us on the ropes and could have got walked out of Camp Nou with two goals. Yeah, yeah. And it just felt like it, it felt like Barca still had the same issues with regards to creating clerical chances because the goal did come from a controversial penalty, which in my opinion should have been a penalty. Same. And defensively, yeah. Barca showed the same weaknesses as like in the past regimes. Well, yeah, it's pretty much expected. I don't think I don't think anything will really change this year. Maybe next year, maybe two, three months into Xavi's dream, we'll see some change if there's to be change. But right now it's going to be a bit more of the same due to, like I said, the personnel, the injuries, everything. The soft center, the lack of concentration on set pieces, because two of their clear cut chances, I think out of the four of them, half of them came from set pieces. So that's something we need to work on. And then on the creation of chances, I thought in terms of creating chances, we did well in this game. It's just that we could have done a bit better. But the first half was definitely better than a lot of the things we played this season. Yeah, that's true. But I guess a, a caveat might be that Espanyol are like one of the worst traveling teams in La Liga. So maybe, but you say that at the moment, like we have to be patient for this Barca team, but you have Benfica midweek and Benfica, they had a rest this weekend. So they didn't play any games. And that's a huge game for Barcelona. If they don't win that game, they could be in trouble. Yeah, if we don't win, let's say we draw, which is the most likely scenario. If we draw, it means we go into the Bayern game hoping that Benfica slip up because I have 1% percent chance or hope that we'll beat Bayern. And I don't want to have to go there hoping we get the results. So whatever it takes, we definitely need to try and win on Tuesday. Yeah, and I'm going to ask a counterintuitive question. Like, is it worth it, Barca, winning this game and going through to the next round? I know financially there's an incentive, right? But do you really think this Barca team can go beyond the last 16 or will it be better to drop into the Europa League and go all the way? I don't even think they can go all the way into the Europa League. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. But here's the thing. Let's see... Right now, just get that objective done because financially it's helpful. And then whoever we get in round of 16, we'll see. But the main aim for me is like up until that point, if we do get there, let's try and improve in the league and then see where we are come February. Yeah. And final question on Barca. Can Xavi take this team back to the top four? Into the top four. Uh, Top four is still very... Good possibility, I think. Any title, no, it's too much. Unless the other teams become like have struggles like us, but top four is right now the realistic goal. Yeah, and speaking of the title, the team that looks set to win it is Real Madrid, and I'm not sure what you saw their game against Granada, but like it was a very I incredible saw, I first saw half. It on <laughs> And and later on, Real Madrid like they took they took the game to another level in the second half. Vinicius Junior was he was amazing. And on this game, I think the key button issue was the red card. But like talk about Real Madrid, like why were they so brilliant in this second half? Modric and Chris, first of all, like they're they're far and away the best midfield duo 
in the league and they really showed their quality in this game. Yeah. Cruz more in the first half, but in the second half, two of them really like when when Real Madrid are on song and they're like they're very fluid, it's down to the creativity of Modric and Cruz. Modric in particular, like he just sees things that no other midfielder can really see. It's just they're just that good. And Vinicius, like you said, has taken his game to another level this season. And that's why they're title favorites at the moment. Yeah, and I really like the third goal. Like the third goal is like just brilliant vision from Benzema because like you don't you expect him to make that pass to Vinicius, but he makes that disguised pass to Modric, and like it just yeah. opens up attack um Sir Granada, and that basically killed off the game. But on star protection, right? Like the red card that um I believe it was Montreux got. Um, I personally don't think that should have been red. I think that's a very strong yellow, but. Yeah. The argument being made is that players like Vinicius um, and in, in the past, you sat into Messi where like most fouls were penalized and were punished. And do you go along with that? Like, do you think at, in the football world, different leagues have the responsibility to protect their stars? You should have, I don't think this should be about stars. You should have the responsibility to protect any player, regardless of whether they're a flair player or not. Obviously, it's a contact sport, but what you do, don't let teams like take advantage of you being too lenient. At the same time, don't like be too strict and just ruin the flow of the game. That's a thing that happens a lot in La Liga, like get like referees giving fouls for little, little things. So the basic thing is that the referees need to be good and better at their job. Yeah, 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 and I felt like, and moving on to the Valencia Real Sociedad game, I felt that was exactly what happened. It was, it was personally, it was a disappointing game. I felt the referee totally lost control. It got like it felt like a grudge match at times, and you see the tackles that were going on, you see the fights, WWE. That were going on, and you're like, they're not even rivals, right? <laughs> exactly. Like after you know, it's in every time Valencia and Real Sociedad that play, I notice that the Spanish players or some players usually swap shirts a lot. So I'm like. Where is this violence coming from in this particular game? Yeah, the referee didn't handle this game at all well. No, it's not like at all. Go yeah, he didn't handle it well. And I feel in some ways, like this was the result that really pleased Borderlass in that, like, they got the clean sheets. And also, I feel in some ways, this showed the limitations of Real Sociedad in that they're not able to break down teams. In fact, they, yeah. they've scored less than a goal a game at their home stadium. Yeah. At home, it seems... At home, yeah, like, even when, when you look at the goals they've scored, a couple of them have come from mistakes from the opposition. But I've noticed this particular trend. The only goals they think to score at home come from, like, long balls, because it seems like creatively at home, against resolute teams, they can't have that... Ma- they don't find that magic too often. So, or a Fabel, right? He makes very good off the ball runs. Those yeah. runs have been key. Other than that, it's as if they're creatively bankrupt at home. And does that call into question how well David Silva has played for them since he, he's come into the side? Yeah, David Silva is the only midfielder, the only midfielder in the team that you look at and say, plays that final penetrative pass, but he hasn't really been doing it this season. Yeah. Marino, Zubi, and the others, they're very good players, but they're not like that David Silva type. Yeah. Yeah, like it's, I, I think they really miss Odegaard, but, and I in that feel, regard, yeah. yeah, games like this just shows that they're limited in like maybe fighting for the league. Maybe like they will be in that top four fight with Barca, but games like this shows that maybe like they can't fight for the league. And another team which had a disappointing result was Sevilla against Alaves. I felt the referee in this game was terrible, but the game was a very good one in the second half. I'm not sure whether you saw it, but like it was it was interesting seeing the players trying to play in a puddle. <laughs> it felt like an amateur sport where like the water is there, the ball was stopping. It was it was funny to watch at times. I saw the game, and I can tell you that was not the worst pitch in the league this weekend. We'll come to that later. But yeah, Sevilla, Alaves, well, first of all, well done to Alaves for 
sticking to the basics and getting themselves out of trouble for now. Sevilla, yeah. again, like real sociality, sometimes can be a bit creatively bankrupt, but the, fa- the thing is that Sevilla, a team that have got, they don't give up easily, and that showed with coming back twice in this game. Yeah, and, and I felt in this game, I felt they, they played a very, I was impressed by them. Like, I know they went behind twice, but they showed like a bit of creativity, like the goalkeeper, Pacheco, had to me a, a string of good saves, which is good because in my fancy team. But, and <laughs> at the end, I think they should have gotten, they should have gotten the winner because the final play, you can see some images that the ball might have gone in. And this causes question, why doesn't La Liga have goal line technology? It's the only top five league that doesn't have it. Yeah, I find it strange that instead of goal line technology, they use they just use the VAR to see the VAR and Hawkeye it's called in particular. So I'm like, just get goal line technology. This isn't the this used to be bad before VAR and with VAR is still bad. So yeah, a lot of games this season that we have to look at the condition of the refereeing. What a surprise. Yeah, and did you see the penalty decision? Like, do you think that was a penalty? I felt it was harsh when I looked at it. I'm like, oh, yeah. He wants a campus to put his hands. Yeah, and moving on to another tight contender, Atletico Madrid. It was another, it was like sort of like typical Atletico Madrid, like from the past, like very, they were like, I felt they were disappointing, but they worked hard, they grafted, and Eventually, Felipe Montero got the goal, and he, he's been a guy who's been criticized from all corners. I don't think he's good enough to play for the team, personally. Um, but, like, what do you think of this performance from him? He really improved in this game. They kept a clean sheet. Do you think this is where their season begins, begins to turn and they start churning in more consistent performances? I don't think it's a it's a season defining results by any means. To be honest, they did need this window because of their form recently. On Felipe, yeah, he's he's been disappointing since his first season. So for him, it's good that he contributes in a good way. The thing with Atletico, it's not just their performance that was a bit down, that was down. The crowd that the one that were unusually quiet. Oh yeah, I, I noticed that because like it felt. Like it felt like a flat game, right? Like there was no, like whenever you watch Atleti, Sevilla, Betis, or Valencia, like they really energize you. But like in this game, it felt like it was, yeah, like you're right, it was very flat, and that was that was worrying. <laughs> yeah. They have important, yeah, they Sevilla, Barca, everyone has important Champions League games as well. So it's important to feel that support from your fans. Like it goes a long way, really. Yeah, and maybe that's why they all like even Rasta said that. Maybe that's why they all had like disappointing games because they you could tell like their the minds of the players were like somewhere else, and maybe they were focused on those big Champions League clashes. Yeah, but yeah, your like mental state needs to be good. What? I said your mental state as a footballer needs to be good. Yeah, it's like really undermined how important your focus it can be. Yeah, that, that, that's that's very true. That's very true. And another team that had that could have had this issue but didn't was Rob Betis. And how brilliant were they in the first 30 minutes of that game against LK? It was and lots of goals. It was an enjoyable performance, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. But as brilliant as Real Betis was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they were I'll tell you something. I, did, I didn't watch the second half because I was disgusted by how pathetic Elche were like. Yeah, honestly, they, they've just been slipping down the table for the last few weeks, and look where yeah. it's gotten them. And they're a team that both of us enjoy because how of how fluid they are and how fluid like yeah. Fran Escobar is. But like that performance, like that cost Fran Escobar his job. Yeah, I'm actually surprised that they're sacking him. To be honest, I saw this stat on Twitter where. The only the last three times LT have stayed up in the Premier Division, their coach was Fran Escriba. So it looks like they're going to have to rewrite history or they're going back to Sagunda. Sure. And do you think a guy like Hernan Crespo, like can like I'm like, do you see the players like warming up to him the same way they warmed up to Fran in the final stages of last season? 
I say I don't know anything. I didn't know Hernan Crespo was a coach. So when I saw his <laughs> name, I was I was shocked. I'm like, what's going on? But yeah, I I don't know to be honest. But giving name recognition could be important to the players or something. True. And but I do know LJ have the attacking quality to stay up. Yeah. And and with LJ, it's like one of the things is they're owned by an agent who owns a lot of the players that he's a top Argentinian agent. And that's why he's bringing a lot of top Argentinian talent. Yeah. And Hernan Crespo is part of his roster of talent. Same with the guy they had last season, Almiron. Yeah. So there might be a bit of nepotism going on here. Like if Crespo does get the job, but he did get a good job in Sao Paulo. He did well. He won the Copa Libertadores um, a couple of seasons ago. So maybe he might, be someone who comes to La Liga and like sets it up a light. We don't know, but let's talk about things we do know, and that's Mano Pellegrini. His record at Betis is superb. This is the first time that Betis has been in Europe, and they've been performing as well as they've done in the previous season. They've been performing better than in the past season. And how far can he take Betis? Can he make them challenge for the Champions League's places, or do you think if they? get into Europe again, that's success? Getting to Europe again would be definitely a success. I think that would be enough for every Betis fan. Real Betis, they still have these games where, like, they can be promising, but then they just have these games where you're like, okay, they're not ready to take that big step yet. But back-to-back league finishes in Europe is definitely progress. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with you with that because, like, I feel the one thing with this Betty side is they're yet to face a really top team on the Pellegrini and win. And maybe they, they would have that chance against Barcelona at the Camp Nou before the end of the year. <laughs> you might not like that, but maybe that might be what changes the dynamic for them against strong teams. You know, I'm playing Betis every time. I, Betis in particular, I'm never worried when we go behind. <laughs> This time, because we had Messi, this time yeah. it's completely different. So yeah. we definitely need to beat them because they are a rival at the moment. Yeah, it's how times have changed. And maybe it might be a similar thing like what happened to Rayo. Like Rayo, this right tonight, they were, they were again, they were so good. But I've praised Rayo every time I've been on this. But you're a different voice. Why are they as good as they are? Why are they brilliant? First of all, they do. The basics, they do, they do basic things very well. And from there, they can expand into different styles. Like if they want, they're a team capable of keeping the ball if they want to. They're a team capable of playing a counter-attack, pressing. They're very organized. And all that comes down to the brilliance of Andoni Raola, who I'm a huge fan of as well. Yeah, and their opponents, Mallorca, like, do you think the wheels have fallen off? Yeah, they they, wrong, they, but... the wheels fell off, like, Six or seven match days ago. Yeah, and do you think they might be sucked into a relegation battle? I think so, because they don't score enough. I I said they might stay up barely because of their defensive strength, but that has been gone. They concede late goals a lot. Today, they were just completely walloped. So, yeah, I think they're candidates to go down more and more. Yeah, and moving on to... uh, Obvious relegation candy, Levante. Levante, they're still winless, but Athletic, what's wrong with them in front of goal? Why can't they score it? Is it personnel? Is it playing style? Because, like, if Iraola can get Nteka and Sergio Guardiola and Oscar Trejo to be scoring goals, I'm sure Mar- I'm sure he would be able to get Munain or Williams or Raul Garcia to score goals. Yeah, but here's the thing. It's not like Inaki Williams doesn't get into good positions. He gets into good positions. But it's like against Levante, Athletic barely created any chance, but the few chances they had, they got into a couple of nice positions and they didn't take advantage. But there is hope for them in the form of Oyhan Sunset and Nico Williams. When these two came on, along with Zaraga and I think Nico Serrano, these four youngsters really improved Athletic's game in the second half. It was too little, too late, but I feel if you want to try something different, you have the tools to do it. 
yeah, even if it means benching somebody. Yeah, like personally, I like Nico Williams. Like he's just he's just very exciting to watch whenever I see an athletic game. And he's the only guy bringing that spark, that like enthusiasm to the game. And yeah, hope I hope, I hope we can see more of him on the Marcelino. Yeah, yeah, and moving on to Hitafe versus Cadiz, like brilliant win for Hitafe. Like who saw that coming? Four <laughs> zero against Cadiz, like no way. And some of the goals were were. Brilliant. There were some brilliant headers. Like Jaime Mata's goal was out of this world. And I like apologize to any Getafe fan out there for that. <laughs> <laughs> because I I told you it's early on a Sunday morning. I am not watching this game. I look at Twitter and I see it's Trinity I'm like, how? Yeah. Well done, yeah. Getafe. This was this was a brilliant performance. Like you said, some of the goals were spectacular. And shout out to Enesu now. He's a player that I I really like. And he's towards the end of last season. And now he's showing that he can be the man that Africa can look to get those. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, when he came in from La Liga, from Man City, like, a lot of expectations were on him. Villarreal spent, like, 14, 15 million on him. And since then, he's never really showed why. But you're right. In the past couple of weeks, he's beginning to show... Why? And has your outlook changed on Hetafe staying up? Do you still think they're going to go down? Or has recent never, performances changed that? And like in the beginning of the season, I actually said they'd finish as high as 13th or 12th. I was like, oh, they're going to go down because of how bad their start is. But then recently, you know, it looks like they have a chance of staying up now. Yeah. And moving on to Salsa versus Villarreal, Villarreal, they press the self-destruct button in this game because they were they were really good. It looked like it was going to be a standard 1-0 victory. And what was really thinking catching the ball like that? <laughs> you said Villarreal pressed the self-destruct button. You should have said again because they keep doing this every single time. <laughs> yeah, It's and- not just Rooney's mistake. Bulaidia and Trigueros had clear chances to make this training. Dituro also made the mistake, but he was able to keep the score down and then you yeah. know, Celta hit Villarreal when Villarreal messed up again. And how do you, I feel sorry for Emery. How do you think this, like that setback, how do you think it's going to affect them going into the game against Manchester United? Because Villarreal so far this campaign, they've been along with Barcelona, they've been the most disappointing team in La Liga. How do you think they're going to go through that game, knowing that Manchester United, they just had a different manager. They're going to have the so-called new manager bounce. Like, do you see them winning this? I, I still, if Villarreal, right, they've gone into Champions League games in a different frame of mind. They've, they've been more, I feel in Champions League games, they've been more direct than they have been in La Liga for whatever reason. If they get some injured players back against Man United, I can see them winning, especially with how fragile Man just United have, have been for a long time. It's in La Liga where I look at them and I'm like, I really don't know what they're going to do. We play them next, so I'm hoping that they can keep giving gifts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll be it'll be interesting to see that game. But like, let's let's focus a bit more on Manchester United, right? Social is gone. Was that was it, is it too late? Too too late? And who's the right candidate to take over from him? Because Zinedine Zidane has been linked, but apparently he's rejected the job. Uh, it's too late. It's way too late. They first of all, you, you like first of all, they shouldn't have extended his contract after the Villarreal final. Even though he didn't do anything sackable, that was the moment where you have to, as a board of director, you have to say, let's make a change. The main problem with that club is the board. The board have no idea. The board just buy impulsively, all that. So what my United need, I think they should just have an interim manager that's good enough for, to the end of the season. And then while they're doing that, like go out with a plan, determine how you're going to go about players, like which how these players fit into a system, what kind of coach can manage that system and then do it. That's what every other reasonable club would do. Like, don't do this thing where if Carrick has a few good games, you give him the job. No, don't do that anymore. 
So yeah, Man United need leadership from the top. And once they once they have a clear plan, things will be better for them. Uh, and it seems like it's going to be hard for them to even get anywhere close to the title because, like, the big three in England all won comfortably. So it seems like that's going to be a is going to be a, a race that they can't win. But let's transition to Italy, right? Because we saw a bit of movement there. Milan they lost to Fiorentina. Inter, yeah, Dusan Zlahovic, like he keeps on performing, right? He's not going to stay in Fiorentina for that long, is he? Yeah. I think City have been linked with him. Atleti have been linked with him. Who else? It's mostly those two that have been linked with him. But yeah, I can't see him staying at Fiorentina beyond this summer. No. But like Milan, they're still joined top because Napoli lost to Inter. And this was like a game that had many wild swings. And I believe Inter right now, they're four points behind. And can they can they win this? Because Victor Ozeman is out. And he seems like he's going to be out for two months. Do you think this is where Inter begins to charge and like take control of Serie A or make it very competitive? Yes, but that all depends on Inter. If if Inter right now, yeah, like you said, Napoli, I just lost Osman for a substantial amount of time. That will undoubtedly affect them. And like I think, like I said the last time on the pod, Syria is anybody's race as long as you just take a, just focus on yourself, take advantage. Like any of maybe four teams can win this, mm. maybe three, but yeah, Inter can definitely win it. For sure. Yeah, and with Juve, it's it's too late for them, possibly. You never know, but you never know. <laughs> They should, wow. they should just they should just get they should just be content with top four, I think. Top four, yeah. The results have been coming for them recently, so I guess that's good. Yeah, it seems like they have a similar arc with Barcelona. It's like they're <laughs> the, the arc is completely similar, except they both no, it's lost exactly the votes. same. Last season we both got knocked out of the UCL at the round of 16. Last season we both won the domestic cup, cup competition. They, <laughs> Best of all time candidates left both clubs in this other. <laughs> yeah. But we're moving on to both clubs are in the Super League. Yeah, true. <laughs> you can't write this stuff. Yeah, it's it's funny how like both clubs have been run so far, and both clubs are huge losses as well. But like there was a feel-good story in Serie A. I'm not sure did you hear about the story between Mourinho and Felix Gain and uh yeah, I saw, I, I saw it yeah, he, he promised him shoes and he's gotten his shoes. That's that's nice from Mourinho. I remember last season, I think he promised Region like this Spanish meat, Hamon or something. Forgive me if I got the pronunciation wrong. And then there's a picture of him giving Region the meat. So Mourinho can be nice like that sometimes. Yeah, it seems like it's transitioning into like a different type of personality. Someone who's more personable and people, the media really like him, people really like him, and um, it's good to see this transitioning or evolution of Mourinho. <laughs> Except when they lose, and then he's a bitter guy again. Yeah. I think against the team that beat them the Europa League 6-1 and then drew 2-2, he was really, he was basically like the Mourinho of old then, I guess, so some things wouldn't change. Sure, but against, like, if a Norwegian team beats you 6-1, like, you you have every right to be upset with your players. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah but not but don't take it out of the poor interviewer. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> True, but I, I have a feeling like Jan Agia Fiota was trying to get under his skin. So <laughs> that's it. <a, laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, at yeah. this point, when you look up Mourinho, you're like maybe for a bit of media coverage. Let's just get a reaction. It's yeah. how it is. Sure. And moving on to Germany, uh, did you see that Bayern lost to Augsburg? This yeah, season? I saw it. <laughs> uh, like, and now Dortmund, Dortmund, they won without Holland and their class is in two weeks. Is there a chance that Dortmund that. could actually win this? No. Let me tell you why. Okay, I watched back the Dortmund game. They really struggled. They had the chance to go close to Bayern, but they really 
made a tough job out of it. Like Royce literally dragged them to the three points. Can Dortmund beat Bayern? Yes. But can they win the Bundesliga this season? No. Yeah, and I sort of agree with you because like I saw them play against Leipzig um before the international break and they they looked all over the place. And this is Leipzig side that they lost this weekend. They haven't really set the world alight and they just make Dortmund look basic, like they were a mid team. So um, I'm not sure how good Marco Rosa has been so far this season. In the Champions League, they've been exposed versus Ajax. So, And they have, they have a must-win game against Sporting Lisbon or Sporting CB this, this Champions League round. So it's going to be interesting to see how things evolve by the time it gets to Christmas with them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think India will be all right and get top four. Yeah. Yeah. But but you you would have to hope that they do challenge Bayern, like, or or go all the way, even if they don't win it, just so things are a bit interesting there. There was one time where Dortmund actually, there was actually a title race in 1819. Dortmund were ahead, but then they, Dortmund did it and Bayern came back into it. It's, it's the mental side they really need to work on. Yeah. And hopefully, like with Holland, if he comes, when he comes back, like it's going to take the team to another level and we can have that exciting tight race we all know we, we want in the Bundesliga. But in Liga, there is no tight race. PSG are 11 points out of Nice. But this weekend was special because Leo Messi, your boy, Scored his first goal in Liga. Finally, he scores in the Farmer League, <laughs> or that's, that's what they say. <laughs> and walk us through his goal, like, and how do you think he's going to move on from this goal? Um, with his goal, it comes down to his very good relationship with Mbappe. Quickly, like in the early days, it's clear that two of them have a better understanding than Messi and Neymar. Personally, before. The move before, like they started playing together. I said, Messi, Neymar, and Mbappe at the same time. I don't really see it being full on. Messi and Mbappe by themselves, or met, or like Neymar and Mbappe by themselves, seems to function much better. Yeah. So it's still there's still work to be done in terms of team chemistry. But yeah, as long as Leo stays fit, I can see him still, you know, doing what he does and scoring goals. Not much analysis there. Yeah, and um, do you think sorry. they can win the Champions League? No. No. What will stop them from winning the Champions League? Because this is the most talented front line on paper. What will stop them from winning the Champions League is the fact that on their approach, they don't seem to do well against teams that are organized. They seem to rely way too much on individual brilliance. And when that brilliance doesn't bail you out, you can be in trouble. Yeah, that, that's true. You make a very good point. And with that, that's the end of our podcast. It's nice to have you again, Oscar. I felt like this conversation nice to have you. interesting. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for listening, viewers or listeners. And adios.